creative superpower. We have the power to manifest as we dedicate attention to our thoughts, but often miss opportunity to achieve the greatest good. Your superpower is waiting to be unleashed to unlock a fuller, more rewarding world for all. Join us every Thursday at noon Mountain Time for Choice, your creative superpower with Zoe DeMuro. And now, here's Zoe. Hello, folks, and welcome to the New Thought Media Network. My name is Zoe DeMuro, and I am honored to be your host for Choice, Your Creative Superpower. If you're coming back, it's good to see you again. And if this is your first time, welcome to the show. I'm a religious science practitioner at the Oakland Center for Spiritual Living in Northern California. I'm also a transformational coach. I assist people in living their lives as fully as possible. Today, in episode four, we'll be exploring the relationship between choice and the stories that we tell. Now, clearly given the name of this show, we are all about creativity. And as you'd imagine, every story has some element of creativity. But when it's your story about yourself, <laughs> or your story about someone else, where does choice come into this picture? How much of a part does creativity play? Why do we choose the stories we tell? Why do we choose the stories we tell about ourselves, about others? How do we choose the stories we tell? So let's dive deep. And if you'll pardon the expression, let's get the story. Or don't pardon the expression, that was terrible. We are storytellers, we being humans, that is. And despite all that scientists who claim that storytelling is a strictly human activity, I am fairly certain that animals tell stories as well. I know in our hotel household, our animals tell stories. Right now, my cat is sitting in another room, sequestered, so that she is not here on this call and she is definitely telling a story. And when mealtime is just a little bit late, there's a story. And when I'm getting ready to go out and I'm not gonna take uh, my dog with me, that was a story, very definitely. It's like, oh man, I never get to go any place. Okay, now the, in all honesty, that might've been my own interpretation or possibly projection. So, Let's stick to human storytelling for this discussion, because in the words of Yuva Noah Harari in his book, Sapiens, he wrote, it is the distinctive ability to believe in stories that separates sapiens from other creatures. And he goes on to say, you could never convince a monkey to give you a banana by promising him limitless bananas after death in monkey heaven. Well, Professor Harari, you've, you've made your point very well. So, humankind then. Well, we know humankind have been storytellers for nearly as long as we have been on this planet. We've seen evidence of some of the earliest stories in, in the cave paintings, dating back as far as, well, I would say, if we were to look at, uh, let's say, the, the images of handprints and bison and horses and such that they found in Spain, uh, in, I believe it was called the Altamira Cave, that dates back to 35,600 BCE. Now, you could argue, I suppose, that we're looking at art. But certainly by 23,000 BCE, looking at the scenes of hunting and rituals, that they found in caves in Brazil, uh, in the Serra de Capabara, we can see that storytelling, visual storytelling, had absolutely begun. Makes me wonder, 
who was the first hunter to exaggerate their hunting prowess? Did did Og turn to Grilb and say, "Oh, you should have seen the one that got away today, man! Um, it was something else." But I digress. Because we have physical evidence, we can surmise a start date for visual storytelling. But when did oral storytelling first take place? This is something that scientists have debated for many, many years. The prevailing thought being that sign language of some sort was certainly our earliest form of communication. And we can see that in chimpanzees, for example, who use actually both sign language and vocalizations to communicate. So our ability to speak in some form or another and therefore tell stories very likely predated visual storytelling by at least hundreds of thousands of years. As our brains evolved, so did our skulls, our jaws, our vocal cords, all of which allowed for us to eventually incorporate a far larger range of sounds than our other primate relatives can. Communication that worked well for a solitary being was not going to be sufficient for a couple or a clan or a village. The more our behaviors changed, they had to change, think of it. So by the more they changed, it was to allow for an ever-growing demand for greater functionality. I mean, think of this. Their basic concepts like danger or follow me, well, those could easily be addressed through body language or a whistle or a grunt. But being able to explain, to differentiate, to share knowledge and preferences, these more complex social interactions required a higher level of communication. So as our needs developed, our brains developed. And our brains developed, we were able to do so much more. So our becoming storytellers was partially because we had to. For our development to exceed that of our nearest biologically similar primate relatives, there had to be a need because nature does nothing frivolously. And so we developed beyond simply surviving literally hand to mouth and started creating what were our first communities whose purpose went far beyond simple protection in numbers. We needed to be able to communicate more complex ideas. We needed to be able to work together to make decisions, to share experiences, which would enable our community, whether that community was a very small one or a larger one, but we needed that to be able to continue to thrive. We also became aware of what we could call a world view, something that went far beyond the confines of our own personal existence. We wanted to understand our world. We wanted to explain to others about our world. We wanted to move beyond the what, the when, and the where. And we wanted to get to the how, and even more importantly, the why. And you see, it's the how and the why that brings an incredible richness to stories. It's what transforms them from a simple statement or a series of facts or observations. And it brings in the element of a narrative a narrative being a deliberate shaping of facts or observations that allow us to arrive at a particular conclusion or perspective, which the storyteller might or might not be aware of consciously. Now, this is where the heart of the matter in storytelling lies. It's in the narrative. We want others to understand our perspective, and we often want them to accept our perspective and to act accordingly, whether we realize it or not. It's the essence of discussion, of argument, of politics, of propaganda, of marketing, of social media. But it's also, it's just a, a normal part of our everyday life. 
You know, if someone tells you about something that they find to be tragic, they want you to feel that sense of tragedy just as surely as they would want you to feel a sense of joy if something brought them joy. So we choose the words we'll use. We choose a feeling tone. We choose which details support our perspective and we may very well choose to avoid other details which do not. In an earlier episode, we spoke about identity, how we identify ourselves. It's probably one of our most primary stories. When we choose to place a title in front of our name or exclude it, we're beginning a specific narrative, or at least we're establishing a point of reference. So if I introduce myself as practitioner Zoe, that says one thing about me, although <laughs> only those of you who know what a practitioner is. If I introduce myself as Reverend Zoe, which you know, technically I can because I am an ordained marriage minister by virtue of an ordination from the AmericanMarriageMinisters.com. If I say Reverend Zoe, I've introduced a different perspective and perhaps even a different expectation. Someone says to you, hey, this is my neighbor, Sonia. That's not quite telling the same story as this is my friend, Sonia. And certainly not, this is my girlfriend, Sonia. If someone says, you wouldn't believe the horrible day I just had, you're now primed to hear about problems or issues of some sort. Then once you've heard about this horrible day, I might very well tell your own story about the individual who gave you that based on whether you could feel at least some comparable level of horribleness or you might choose to see the person as being overly sensitive or not taking responsibilities for themselves and thereby creating a story about that. See, we are indeed storytellers. We are story interpreters. We are story judges. When we tell stories, we are making an enormous number of choices. Is this the story I want to tell? Is this the right time to tell this story? Is this the right audience for this story? What, what details would I see as being important to include? What details would be important to exclude? Remember, we're not just necessarily reciting facts and observations as we know them or we believe we know them. <laughs> we're shaping a narrative. Mark Twain once said, and he supposedly said this since pretty much everything in the world is attributed to him, but he once said, theoretically, there are three kinds of lies. There's lies, damned lies, and statistics. Well, statistics are facts, are they not? Such as, there are more than 7 billion people on this planet today. But statistics placed into a specific context or juxtaposed just right with other details can provide a narrative that becomes at times a bit or even a whole lot different from a recitation of facts. There are over 7 billion people on this planet, most of whom are, now you can fill in whatever blank you would like and you can watch how you can build a different narrative. That is your choice, right? Now, the person who writes the narrative has a specific outcome in mind and wants you to reach the same conclusions to support that outcome. So our storytelling can become very involved when we add in the intent of providing a specific targeted narrative. And that isn't necessarily a bad thing. It doesn't have evil intent simply because it's a narrative. For example, every time 
I'm asked to provide a short biography. I find myself searching for just the right choices that would present me most effectively to my audience and most appropriately for the occasion or the setting. And I'm not saying it's meant to be this rah-rah celebration of, of my strengths or capabilities, but it is a way to shape appropriate expectations or to establish credibility or a particular energetic, particular vibe, if you will. Here's another key point about stories. <clears throat> we choose what we look for and we choose what we look out for in stories based on what we choose to believe about the storyteller. Years ago, a company I worked at uh, at that time asked me to manage a team that had this one particular employee, let's, let's call him Justin. And if your name is Justin, folks, I don't know you, so I'm not talking about you. So Justin was late coming back from lunch eh, pretty much every day. He always had a reason that sounded reasonable. But over time, got to the point where whatever Justin came up with his reason, it was just way too easy. It was almost logical, in fact, to choose to see it as an excuse, if not an outright lie. Trial attorneys are experts at steering a narrative. Obviously, they're not going to stand there and lie. That would be unconscionable and illegal. But they will very carefully choose what they say and don't say, how they say it. And they'll often prepare their witnesses as well because they need to achieve a desired verdict. That's their job. Marketers do this every day. There's no denying the power of a good marketing campaign. And politicians, do we even need to go there? I don't think so. <laughs> now, please, I am not suggesting that attorneys and marketers or politicians are these evil manipulators. But I will say that they understand the connection between stories and choice probably better than anyone. In fact, it's one of the reasons that they're successful at what they do. Hopefully not the only reason, unless you're a marketer. <laughs> but let's turn away from our choices about other people's storytelling. Because I want to look at the stories we tell about ourselves. This is where choice becomes truly powerful. Now, we actually tell many stories about ourselves. Most of them are short, and we do this constantly. For example, you get up in the morning, you yawn and you stretch, think, ah, I'm facing a really tough day today. And then you know what? Your day is tough. You're starting at the, uh, a race. You're standing there. That's the starting line for a race. You turn to the person next to you and you say, you know what? I am going to run really well today. I just, I just feel it. And you get out there and you give it all you've got. You're going to go into a meeting and you angrily mutter, I am absolutely not going to let Justin get away with anything today. And there you go, ready to pounce. Or how about the simple but powerful, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm sorry. Every one of those is a story. A story that you've chosen and a story that may very well determine just how fulfilling your experience of life will be for a moment, for a while, for a very good long while, depending upon the actions resulting from your choices. Another way we tell stories which have a profound effect on our lives is through what are kind of offhand comments that are really self-judgments. Make that self-limiting self-judgments. I'm a slow learner. I just don't have a head for the stock market. I could never do public speaking. I will never be able to understand this principle. I've said all of those. I've believed all of those. I've been trapped by all of those because I choose 
or I chose rather, to let a closed mindset limit me and cast doubt on my ability to grow. I chose in that moment to tell a story of lack, of limitation, rather than one of abundance and possibility. The stories we have chosen to tell about ourselves or about another person or about our lives or even the world itself, we sometimes forget that we've made up those stories and we embed them, we ingrain them into our lives as facts. And as you know, <laughs> our choices are most certainly affected by what we believe to be facts. When I was a boy, I remember hearing my mother telling people that my older sister was the wild one. My younger sister was just quite simply, she was a joy, a little princess. My brother was a problem and I was a disappointment. You know what? We bought into those stories and we all played those parts very well. Sadly, my older sister and my brother are gone now, and so I can't ask them for their take on all of this, which I would love to have known. But I can tell you that my younger sister and I eventually did learn to express our own creativity and write our own stories. All right, truth be told, my younger sister is a joy. What can I say? I love you, Annie. <laughs> as for me, the one person who sees me as a disappointment, my toughest critic, at least the one person I'm certain does it at times. It's got to be that goofy guy I see when I look in the mirror. <laughs> now, he and I are starting to get along a lot better and a lot less judgy because we've got better stories now. Well, it's pretty clear that negative stories have a very profound effect on our lives. So what do we do about that? No, we often speak of our consciousness and how we have, uh, how everything that we've heard and experienced and been told, all of that goes into this mix. And it includes the stories we have chosen to hold on to, regardless of their origin. So should we spend the day staring at our reflection and do this Stuart Smalley impression and saying, I'm good enough, I'm smart enough, and doggone it, people like me. Well, I suppose that wouldn't hurt, but I really had something different in mind. Now, we've established that we are creative beings. And we've established that the more we tell a given story, the more ingrained the story becomes in our identity, in our psyche. So why not take that creativity and start making better choices? Why not make choices that reflect our authentic self? Why not tell stories about others? Why not make choices that reflect their truth? Two values that I hold to be so important to me that they feel sacred, for want of a better word, are authenticity and integrity. Come to think of it, values like loving, compassionate, nurturing, supportive, these are also sacred. They are literally qualities that I would say are divine. Why wouldn't I want all of those qualities reflected in and shaping the stories I choose to tell about myself or about others? Now, yes, not every story is going to necessarily be particularly sweet or endearing, but I want every story I tell to reflect my authenticity and my integrity. Now, somewhere in my research, I came across a list of questions which are a great test for integrity and authenticity. Check these out. Am I telling the truth or is it my version of the truth? What other perspectives could be taken? Am I being open and honest about the agenda I have for telling this story? Will it benefit my listeners to see the story from another angle. What details and information am I leaving out and why? In his book, The Content of Form, Hayden Wives says, 
narrative might well be considered a solution to a problem of general human concern. Namely, the problem of how to translate knowing into telling. Folks, for my money, one of the most important pieces of knowledge of knowing, yes, knowing is a better word because it's visceral. So one of the most important pieces of knowing that we have is that God, loving spirit, Gaia, is all there is. So why wouldn't I want the telling of that knowing to be clear and accessible? You know, no matter what story we're telling, there can be no story that we could ever choose that would bring us a greater feeling of fulfillment than to express our greatest, our most profound truth. We do that exactly each time we choose to pray affirmatively, each time we choose to use spiritual mind treatment. Because we literally start a treatment by reminding ourselves of the truth of loving spirit. Then we express our unity with loving spirit. And therefore, how that truth is our truth as well. There can be no other. And then we express how it outpictures in our lives as we, in gratitude, release our word to the law of the one. Now, those are choices that tell a story of wholeness, completeness, and perfection. In the book Wired for Story, author Lisa Crone states that story, as it turns out, was crucial to our revolution, more so than opposable thumbs. Opposable thumbs let us hang on. Story told us what to hang on to. When our story veers, our story veers towards fear, towards uncertainty, towards anger and loneliness, we choose to co-create a story that is undeniable, pure. All right. One in which we realize that we have the ability to save ourselves from ignorance, from falsehoods, from exclusion. And what could be better to hold on to than a deep and profound understanding of who and whose we are? and all that that knowing brings. If you want to see a change in your life that is absolutely profound, look at the stories you tell. Look at the stories that you have told so consistently that it would be hard to deny them. Are they stories of lack or are they stories of abundance? Are they stories that speak of fear or are they stories that speak of your faith? Are they stories that impugn or are they stories that celebrate? Now, of course, not every story you tell is going to be a sweet story, but you can ensure that every story that you tell is authentic, is true, and reflect your values. I'd love to hear how you're choosing your stories. So if you have an opportunity, you can email me at zodiamuro at gmail.com and let me know, how do you handle stories? What is it that's important to you? Um, by the way, if there's a topic relating to choice, that would you like uh, to see me address in a future episode? By all means, let me know. Folks, I appreciate your spending time with me this week. Be sure to explore all that the New Thought Media has to offer. For example, today here at 12 noon Pacific time, that's 1 p.m. Mountain time, check out Finding the Joy in the Journey with practitioner and soon to be minister, the ever insightful Gina Calvario Kupka. Uh, my time is running short, so I will simply say that I will see you again next week. And until we do, I hope that you choose wisely. I wish you much love and many, many blessings. Namaste.
choice, your creative superpower. We have the power to manifest as we dedicate attention to our thoughts, but often miss opportunity to achieve the greatest good. Your superpower is waiting to be unleashed to unlock a fuller, more rewarding world for all. Join us every Thursday at noon Mountain Time for Choice, your creative superpower with Zoe DeMuro.